Good morning, everybody. Uh, Nigel Cornwall here uh, from Net Zero East. Uh, welcome to our launch event. Um, uh, we've got a, a fascinating program for you today, um, which uh, covers a range of well-known um, uh, people from outside our organisation, and then my team within Net Zero East who are going to outline for you uh, what we are hoping to achieve with this uh, new uh, initiative. Um, we've got um, roughly two parts to the programme. Uh, the first hour, which um, uh, shortly I will hand over uh, to Simon Skillings, who will act as uh, compare and who will uh, deal with uh, the questions that, that, that you raise uh, and, and try and tease out some of the key learnings from the presentation. Uh, so that will come first and then we're going to switch over uh, and take a, a closer look about the particular work streams that we're, we've scoped within uh, Net Zero East, which um, are really around taking uh, the knowledge that we've built up over the years, uh, working in market reform, uh, promoting low carbon, and increasingly trying to drive Net Zero forward, and how we're going to try and work with local stakeholders, a wide range of people, local authorities, utilities, businesses, and of course, consumers and householders uh, to build awareness of what needs to be done uh, to deliver uh, net zero. Um, um, you will hear a lot of references to things like uh, place-based solutions, uh, consumer-centric engagement, because we think these are all um, at the uh, core of now moving from very high level aspirational targets uh, to detailed delivery programs that can be mobilized at the local level by local authorities, businesses uh, and householders. So that's our objective today, to share with you why we're doing this, uh, to point the direction of work and also to signpost how we are working uh, alongside a lot of the people I've worked with over the years and have considerable respect for, uh, the, the fresh thinkers, the ones who are, are raising new ideas uh, and try and blend some of that thinking uh, into our programme. So that's um, my welcome. Um, I think uh, the timing of today's launch is not uh, an accident. Um, uh, we've seen a very busy period recently uh, of policy uh, activity around realising net zero. The target was um, legislated for back in June uh, 20. 19 um, and uh, we are midway through a period uh, which will run um, either to November this year with COP26 or possibly uh, uh, next year and we've seen a number of watershed uh, moments um, over recent months. I guess the real momentum started to be built in mid-November last year with the Prime Minister's uh, 10 point plan. Uh, we've had a draft six carbon budget since then, which has raised the level of ambition uh, 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 required to deliver uh, meaningful progress uh, against targets. And we have, of course, had the uh, energy white paper. Um, I think our starting point is that 2021 can and must be a pivotal year. Um, the 10 point plan had, funnily enough, 10 key targets um, and uh, directions outlined in it. Uh, the Energy White Paper had something like 90 specific actions and promised a range of further strategies. Um, 
but I think all of that thinking, uh, the building blocks now need to be uh, pulled together. We know what the overarching framework is, but we're focused here in Net Zero East on building from the ground level up because um, uh, central policies will not deliver uh, local development, uh, uh, particularly as we work through the whole concept of building back better and the green recovery. We need specific actions, uh, specific activities, clear ownership and joined up programmes. And at the moment, uh, we, we do not see many of uh, those um, uh, around. And in the wider context, we are, of course, already you know, two and a bit years into the runway of a, of a two uh, of a of a thirty year program. So by the time we get to uh, Glasgow, we will you know we will be ten percent of the way there. So we need to start looking at delivery and understanding what good looks like. So steps in the right direction. Let's think about what's needed next. Next slide, Michael, please. Next one, actually. Next one again. Right. So I've already said that we've got some very um, clear but still aspirational top down uh, targets. Um, we also know that local flexibility uh, and smart local energy systems are a key element um, of uh, the solution and off gen. Uh, recently set out its thinking, I think it was in its uh, uh, future work program around delivering um, on average five billion pounds of benefits from what it called full chain flexibility. But those benefits will not happen on their own. They require a catalyst um, and place based strategies. And that's where Net Zero East uh, comes into it. Um, and we're very keen to use our knowledge to try and set priorities locally, support key stakeholders, uh, particularly the local authorities, and to develop uh, these challenging uh, but realistic action plans which will allow uh, measurable uh, progress. Um, a little bit later, we're going to hear uh, about the tools that we're developing uh, to try uh, and help in that pro process. Um, uh, and if you move on, Michael, to the next slide, please. Um, don't want to frighten people before we started engaging, but if you look at the uh, latest statistics from the Tyndall Centre um, and uh, the carbon budget allowances, if we do not make very early and quick progress we will have used up our carbon allowances within the next 10 years so the need to front load uh, these programs is very very important uh, and therefore what we'd like to do today is to uh, set the scene identify some good recent thinking uh, and then pick up the debate how we might take that down to the regional level here in East Anglia. Moving on, Michael. So today's programme, um, I'm delighted to say we have uh, three uh, excellent contributors, people I've worked with and known uh, in some cases for a number of years. Um, Laura will be joining us fairly soon, um, I believe. Um, but uh, Laura Sandis from Challenging Ideas will be known to many of you. Laura's been doing some uh, super thinking around her recosting energy, recosting regulation uh, studies, which have injected a lot of very fresh thinking uh, into um, uh, industry um, uh, policy and, and development. Um, um, and and uh, Laura is going to set out some thoughts on, on the need to drive local transformation. Uh, we've also got Guy Newey, um, who will uh, be talking to us about some of the work that the Catapult are doing, the Energy Systems Catapult, uh, a very important technique called 
local area energy planning, which we're hoping uh, to uh, promote uh, within uh, our area. And thirdly, Ed Burkett from the Policy Exchange, uh, who've been producing some really good fresh thinking recently, uh, particularly around uh, locational issues, the need for market change, uh, and also a very good report on some of the planning issues uh, that we're trying to tackle that unite offshore development with onshore transformation. Uh, so those are our three speakers. Um, and on that note, I will hand over to Simon Skillings, who will uh, introduce the front end of the programme uh, and also uh, compare the questions that you have. Please put your questions in the chat function. Uh, we're prepared to uh, pull out the key learnings uh, and questions and try and structure a debate around those uh, in the balance of the programme. So over to you, Simon. Well, thank you very much, Nigel, and good morning, everyone. Um, I've had the pleasure uh, of working with Nigel uh, over a period of what is now uh, decades. Uh, uh, and, and what I can safely say is that uh, we are at the most exciting period that I can remember in the development of the energy industry. And one of the key aspects of that excitement is the increase in the number of stakeholders and participants and and um, organizations that are critical to the policy challenges and achieving outcomes for customers. Now, the role of local authorities in achieving net zero is an issue which has been recognized, I think now for some time. What hasn't unfortunately been achieved is working out how you harness the ambition and potential actions that exist at the local level, meld it together with central direction, oversight, umbrella policies, and actually achieve the targets. Um, that is a critical issue. Now, I'm hoping that we can discuss some of those issues over uh, the next uh, slightly less than a uh, couple of hours. Uh, we have, as Nigel said, three great speakers and 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 Guy in the uh, Justin uh, give you a warning that in the absence of uh, Laura appearing, we'll go to you uh, first. So make sure you're ready for that. Uh, so uh, as um, Nigel said, Laura and of course, the great thing about Laura is that she's comes from a completely different perspective and has really taken great pleasure and been very successful in sort of um, uh, challenging the conventional wisdoms um, that those of us have who've been working in this industry for a, a very long time. Uh, Guy has been overseeing some absolutely fantastic work in the energy system catapult uh, and we're really looking forward to hearing what's being said there. And, um, and Ed is continuing the reputation of, of policy exchange for some sort of really high quality thought leadership in uh, in aspects of of, of of policy. So um, we'll we hope to get Laura. I'm looking across. Oh, there's, a, there's an L there. That, that's encouraging. Um, I don't know uh, whether we should whether Laura is. Can can someone give me an indication as to whether we're able to go to Laura yet or whether we need to to wait on that? Um, uh, just whilst we're resolving that. Uh, what, as, 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 as Nigel said, if you can place questions in the uh, in the q and I'll keep an eye on that. I'll pick out uh, two or three of those and um, uh, we'll uh, run through those at the end of each presentation. So we'll do separate Q&As with each uh, speaker at the end of their presentations. Um, if no one asks questions, I will have some. Don't worry about that. Um, but uh, uh, so I think we're ready to start with uh, with Guy. So over to you. Thanks, Simon. Um, so look, if if all we had to do was decarbonize the electricity system, then I'm not sure we need to be here today. We could all be 
outside enjoying the sunshine, uh, uh, the fresh spring uh, that's coming through, or, that, or, or more likely we'd be on another Zoom call uh, um, uh, uh, backed up uh, as, as we tend to these days. But, but you know, whilst we've had this incredible success of decarbonising the electricity system in the, in the UK over the last 10 years, and it's important to remind ourselves of that, that success, the next phase the next challenge is going to be to be different, as 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 Nigel uh, set out, and why this 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 launch today is so timely. Because the next phase is largely, you know, to some extent, going to be about transport and and heating, and these are things that affect uh, real people. Um, you know, whilst electricity, uh, my light still comes on, whether the electricity is coming from an offshore wind turbine or from a coal-fired power station, which is, you know, what most people worry about when they think about their electricity, as well as their bill a bit. Um, when they're, when you talk about heating or, or transport, it's a very different uh, kind of experience. And the other, of course, characteristic, as well as being, you know, much more important to think about consumers, is that it's also going to be, it's also going to be geographically specific. You know, the challenge of decarbonising um, uh, Norwich is very different to the challenge of decarbonising Felixstowe or Southwold or where, wherever it is, or Cornwall or Edinburgh or, or, or whatever. You need to understand the state of the building stock. You need to understand the state of the grid locally. You need to understand uh, the industrial base to link to um, to, to, to others, uh, other, other areas. And of course, that gets you back quite quickly. You also need to understand the electricity system because this is going to be a much more um uh you know certainly transport gonna be much more electrified uh system um and therefore you need to understand how the uh, electricity system integrates with the the wider energy and in in the terms that we'd use of the uh, the energy systems catapult you need to think a uh, whole system about uh how you how you fit that together and and look there's a real missing piece of the um the the, the jigsaw. You have, um, you know, hundreds of local authorities across the country uh, declaring climate emergencies. That's fantastic news. As as well as doing my catapult job, I'm also a non-executive de director for an organisation called UK 100, which is about pushing uh, activity at local authority levels. Fantastic to see that. How many of those, you know, whatever it is, 250 odd local authorities have got a robust plan? A real detailed, investable plan to get to net zero. Uh, not enough, I would I would say. So there's a big danger of a kind of political kickback between the aspiration, which is fantastic, and the actual practical reality. How is this going to happen uh, on the ground? Right, now I'm going to try my own bit of innovation and try and get my slides up on the screen. So apologies if this uh, all goes uh, horribly wrong. We'll, uh, we'll, we will see. Oh, I've gone straight to the end slide. Start off with right. Can I, can can people see that? I'm I'm going to take uh, silence as a as a as a as a yes. Um, so so look, as I've said out already, some of the toughest challenges for decarbonisation are going to require uh, local and regional coordination action. So buildings, you know, what's the right combination of uh, energy efficiency, new heating, hydrogen, uh, electrification, etc., in different in different local areas. This big, huge question about the future of the the gas grid, which um, you know is often seen as a kind of some point a minister is going to come down, kind of national lottery style, and say it is you and point to one or the other. How can we break that decision down? How can we actually think about what's uh, what what the future of the gas network is, as well as you know challenges about minimising the cost. Um, and the integration of technology, because this stuff's got to work together. If you're at the end of a grid and, you know, everyone in your cul-de-sac gets a Tesla uh, at, the, at the same time, then, you know, you're putting quite a lot of pressure on the system, particularly, you know, if you add heating, electrified heating into, into those questions. So what, so faced with these problems, what we at the at Catapult of the last few years have developed this concept of local area energy uh, planning and others have been working on similar areas, um, uh, and, and you know we've been we've been working with a, a wide range of uh, partners. But it's based on this idea that every local every area is uh, different, um, uh, and we've we've set up this process and prototyped this process with um, a few local authorities for Newcastle, with Bridgend, um, and with uh, Bury in, in Greater Manchester um, to, to try and test what would you need to do to get to a robust plan. And in, a, in the 
short time I've got available, I'm going to try and rush through how you would approach um, uh, approach that that problem. So this is the kind of three stages you do. This is a very colourful chart of uh, Berry in uh, Greater Greater Manchester. Your first stage, um, and I think Nigel's going to talk about this, is, is 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 getting the data right, the mapping of a particular area right. I mean, it, it sounds an obvious thing to do, but actually our kind of local areas are not that well um, kind of kind of mapped. DNOs, etc. Certainly a few years ago, didn't really have a good idea of what was going on um, at, a, at, a, at a local level, certainly compared to other sectors. So you've got to get, you, you know, we're going, to, we're going to introduce this properly. You've got to do good data, and that means drawing on lots of different uh, data sources. And that's a really exciting area that um, that's that's coming uh, coming forward. Um, then you have to actually model out what a credible set of scenarios are in a particular a particular area. You know, you have to once you've got that kind of baseline data, you need to think about what does that proper transition um, to 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 a plan. But you can't just then land a technocratic plan. This is the perfect uh, plan for Norfolk, for, for East Anglia, that the model has spat out, right? You, at the same time, you absolutely have to have this uh, deep consultation with key stakeholders in a, in a local area because you have to work through to a credible um, transition. You can't just, you know, what, what, what we found in our experience is the first meeting is, you know, a local authority might go, well, yeah, it's just easy. We just, you know, we make everyone's houses so energy efficient that, um, that the demand is absolutely tiny um, and uh, uh, there won't be any problem about the heating system. And you go, well, fine, but this is the cost of doing that. And how are you going to get the resources? There? And it's it's this conversation. But equally, if the model spits out an answer, say we well, can't do that because this is a particular area of fuel poverty, we need to prioritise this in terms of energy efficiency. And so it's that back and forth conversation between a, between, you know, it's got to be a credible plan, but it's also got to be a plan that enjoys local consent. So you've got to go back and forth of that, that proper planning uh, process, which is a thing that's kind of totally missing from the infrastructure at the moment. And when I say getting down to granular detail, you know, what you can see if, you, if you're able to see this in the bottom left hand corner is this area of Berry, which is a zoomed in area of um, uh, one of the one of the parts of the city, you know, you really need to understand when the houses were built because that will tell you roughly what their heat decarbonisation uh, 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 pathway might be um, as as we go. And it's this crucial combination of of data, of planning, and of local consultation is why groups um, uh, groups like Net Zero is going to be so important because you need these. You need to understand the particulars of a local area, and you need to be able to 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 work with uh, with with people to re uh, and, and understand where the pressures are in a in a particular a particular area. And right now, when I think about how we're trying to do um, decarbonisation, particularly of transport and buildings, we're doing so much of it from Whitehall, so much of it from where you know I, I've worked and some brilliant people working there, but they can't they can't have the level of knowledge on the ground. Um, and whilst you know market design is is really important, I'm sure Ed's going to talk about that, and we spend a lot of time thinking about it. Uh, and industry and market players are really important. Some decisions have to be made on kind of a monopoly infrastructure, and this is where planning comes in. So there's lots of Lots of activity kind of bubbling up, I would say, in, in this space, but it's not not particularly coordinated. It's just a list of some of the stuff that's going on, Wales, Scotland. In England, you've got lots of interest from local authorities. There's talk about heat network zones, which kind of have some um, some 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 comparison here. You know, lots of areas are realizing I need to understand this. I need a process and a plan for for doing it. Not yet clear how much uh, government, central government in in England in particular is looking at it, but a lot more optimism about Scotland and Wales uh, going forward. Um, of course, I should add as well that the other thing you've got to join up with is the network price control process because because that is where one of the key investment decisions are made. And so local authorities roles and local stakeholders roles in there can be, if I'm frank, a bit weak. Um, uh, and there's certainly no statutory obligations. So how do you make sure um, that, 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 that networks and the best networks are doing this, having proper conversations with uh, local areas based on, on real data and not a kind of, you know, a, a deep shared uh, kind of 
joined approach to to how they're going to make the transition. So look, what what else? So I mean, you know, our, our thinking is that that the local area energy planning needs to be introduced across um, across the country as a as a as a as a priority. But of course, having a good robust investable plan doesn't lead to investment in in projects. You need to join it um, with uh, with with uh, other things. So. Um, you know, you, first of all, you need to, as I said, align it with a network price control process with Rio going forward. Now, the Rio 2 has made a lean towards local area energy planning. It said it could provide uh, important evidence. You're seeing some, um, you're seeing some network uh, DNOs and, and GDNs starting to get serious about this, but in our view, it could go um, a lot further. Crucially, you need to align the various, the kind of alphabet soup of regional funding pots, which you need some kind of PhD to be able to, to, to navigate. I'm sure plenty of people on this call are much more adept uh, than we are about that. But they need to be, when they're supporting low carbon projects, they are really um, that they are really based on on robust plans. They kind of identify the priority projects that are that are, that are that are needed, and they're not. You know, there's a lot of chat in the media at the moment about kind of cronyism and uh, you know whoever gets the the help at a, a kind of national level because you know the right person. That could equally be the case at uh, local level. You know, oh god, we've got this big net zero plan. I don't know what to do. Oh, my mate down the golf club has got a insert solar scheme in so and so that sounds good let's do that that is potentially a big waste of public money it's much more about how do we uh you know what 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 using evidence using local consultation to get to an agreed set of priority projects which we should we should get on when the funding pot should be aligned there's chat about the national infrastructure bank being uh, an important uh uh player in in that um and it's also potentially you know a big government spends a lot of time of talking about uh, leveling up and building back better, as as Nigel mentioned. Um, uh, this could be a real catalyst for that, you know, low carbon, be, you know, identifying the projects that need to be funded. And then in our view, you should go further and you should choose a few areas across the country as, as trailblazers, what we call net zero uh, pathfinders, and really go for it. Let's really try and understand how this works, because this is a how challenge now. We cannot, can sit and argue about the what needs to be done, but actually, how do we make sure this works? How do we make sure we get the skills at the right level, at a local level? Um, how do we make sure that the electricity system is going to cope? How do we get the market design right? And that brings me on to my final point, which I'm sure Ed will, will talk about and Laura will, will talk about in, in more detail because because you know the planning pit is bit of it it's not everything you also need to get your market design right so that you can enable local flexible solutions to these problems it's not just about building another um uh, you know reinforced substation or another power source locally it is actually about flexibility but that will only be unlocked if you get the market design right we produced a piece of work looking at it uh, calling for a kind of very significant look at this Ed and, and Laura have produced similar pieces of work in the last last few months it's potentially a really exciting transformative thing so you've got to get the market design right but in addition you have to get uh, a set of credible plans if we could to have a chance of capturing the opportunity that you're going to get from the transition to net zero. I'll stop there. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Guy. I uh, just have a look at the through the questions. I think the questions are mainly sort of uh, questions relating to um, uh, the uh, net zero east um, aspect, so can be picked up uh, later. Uh, so just a quick question from me on the uh, local area energy plans. You mentioned that you've been trialing some of these. I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, have any have any sort of real opportunities emerged from that in yeah. terms of things that that really can be progressed now quickly, immediately? And conversely, are they throwing up some big obstacles and challenges? That, that, that seem to be common to a number of areas. Yeah, so um, so they're definitely leading to, to to action on the ground, not on the scale that is needed. I, I you know, I'll be I'll be perfectly honest about it. But but you know, the plan in in Bury is uh, uh, and you know, Greater Man is part of Greater Manchester. You know, being one of the most serious players in this 
um, in this in this transition. So there are renewables projects that are being identified off the back of the plan. There are uh, energy efficiency upgrades. It's kind of you know looking at uh, options for social housing, and it's helping them build the case for for them navigating all those pots of money that I talked about. And they've been able to win funding partly because they've got this credibility of a of a plan behind them. Similarly, in Newcastle, Bridge End's a really interesting example. Um, you know, a, a relatively small uh, local uh, local authority in, in South Wales, um, but because it's got this, it's, it's really worked hard to think through what the transition is actually need. It means it's just very well placed for getting, you know, investment in heat networks. Um, they, you know, they've they've joined up with, you know, kind of mine water project there in terms of uh, a, a heat system there. And again, you know, that's that's because you have got to understand the local geography. You've got to understand what the potential is for for energy resources uh, there, and again, that could help with their, their heating. So it does catalyze effort, it, in, but it will really go gangbusters if it's if it's formalized into wider processes in terms of pots of money, in terms of off gem, etc., and becomes the kind of you know as we see it, the kind of backbone of of the transition of local areas. Um, in terms of challenges, the, the challenges are you know, that you have to then go and scramble around for money from from different pots, as it were. It, there's, a, there's a danger of of creating a frustration of great. We've got this plan. We understand what we need to do. We understand what the priority projects are. Oh, God, we've got to go and wrestle MHCLG for the next two and a half years to get a small bit of it uh, funded, etc. There's no mechanism for getting. And, you know, most of these areas want to get private sector investment. They don't want it just be a, a kind of subsidy junkie role. It's about, well, how can we have a long term investment to the transition in a particular area, um, et cetera. So so it's the, the the danger. It's got to be joined up in terms of the wider um, the wider funding, which is why I would say the national infrastructure banks seems like it's going to have a mandate for local authorities and for for net zero. I think that could be really exciting, but still details to be seen. That's absolutely brilliant, Guy. Um, I still think that the questions coming in are more uh, focused uh, towards uh, Nigel and his colleagues to be picking up uh, later. So um, so let's move now to uh, Laura. Welcome, Laura. I noticed you were having a few uh, problems joining us. Um, uh, fire away with your uh, presentation. Thank you very much indeed and absolutely great to be part of this and congratulations to um, <clears throat> to Nigel and the team for pulling this together. I hope you can see some slides there. Fantastic. Well, um, as everybody has said and particularly obviously Nigel's key point is this issue around location, location, location. And very, very good to follow Guy, who's really got, um, in some ways, the structure and the systems around how we can actually deliver a proper um, localised strategy that builds into a national uh, programme for net zero. So just to sort of give a little bit of a context of where the system is and whether you're the leader of a local authority or whether you're uh, the Secretary of State, you're probably sitting in the middle here. Um, you're looking at the legacy, pro legacy systems, um, big is beautiful, um, the man from Whitehall knows best um, and a lot of lack of visibility of the system to really exciting and dynamic and actually very productive and consumer orientated system, which is the new system. Uh, I have to have something around uh, Monty Python and everything I do, so blessed are the cheese makers. Um, but we also have EV cars that are going to play a part. We're looking at energy efficiency. We're looking at the action moving from the generation side very much to the demand side, which actually offers itself very importantly to different locations having different profiles um, and different outcomes. So if we think about this new system, um, it will be very much demand driven. But if what one's doing is trying to design the system and you're sitting here in the middle looking very confused, um, <clears throat> it is because currently it's all being done on a national basis. 
And so we end up losing the granularity. We end up losing the uniqueness, the unique contribution that let's say East Anglia can play as opposed to Manchester, which has a different role to play with different requirements. We've now got to start, instead of designing the energy system around um, the generation side, we've got to start looking at the needs of those particular localities, and they are fundamentally different. So Nigel said to me, <clears throat> we must start moving quickly and th this should be one of my messages. We absolutely do need to move very quickly, um, but we must recognise that one size does not fit all. And I'm going to cover a little bit, really following on from Guy's excellent presentation, this issue about how do we create the right devolution tools. And I see somewhere like East Anglia that's got an identity, it's got some huge resources in terms of energy generation, but also a lot of the complexities um, that the whole system needs to address as actually an excellent area to start. So it needs to be local and local in many ways is, is local and regional and working together. As Guy said, you need a strategic plan. One of the things that I think we absolutely need to get clear, and, and Guy definitely um, sort of talked about this, were these devolution tools. Now, I'm pressing very hard with Ofgem, with the um, energy system operator, um, and with government. They have got to start to create these devolution tools, which create the frameworks into which localities can operate with freedom, but understanding that the system is interoperable. But at this moment, there is a big sucking up of power and action that is going centralized. And then in some ways, you as a locality are allowed to play, you know, in the kindergarten area, um, you're allowed to play with the soft toys, but actually you don't have the agency or the mechanisms to ensure that um, you can actually design a system that works for you lo locally, but also complements and doesn't start to um, contravene uh, the national proposition. Um, skills are huge as, a, as an area, and I really think that there's a big opportunity for, um, for East Anglia to really look at its further education sector, not just universities, but also skills within councils. And I think that this is where the energy system catapult um, <clears throat> local energy planning is absolutely crucial in building those skills and providing that strategic overview. And then in many ways, devolving the actions and assets in, and so approaches um, to those areas. But it is a transfer of skills. I'm uh, quite involved in Northern Ireland and um, they are proposing a one-stop shop for consumers, um, which actually allows them to look at how these assets and how the energy decarbonisation is going to impact them. And then my last point here on this slide is it's all about collaboration. And the energy sector has been very, very insular for many, many years. But if you look at East Anglia, you've got agricultural players, you've got food processing manufacturers, you've got uh, consumers, you've got all sorts of different players who all play a part in this new energy system. And we as a sector need to get out a lot more and actually open up to other people who might have solutions. So where would one see, in many ways, this builds very much on what Guy was saying, where does one see the strategic planning driving this transformation? Um, East Anglia, you have got a huge amount of opportunities around this integration, and it's the integration of your offshore capacity of hydrogen potential, mobility, but nuclear also. But look at agriculture, that is something you've got a very, very clear lead on. And how does that feed into the energy system and the net zero uh, dimension? So the question is, who is going to take that strategic planning uh, brain and actually drive this forward? But I'm a great person, I mean, I'm not a great person, I'm a hopeless person, but I'm a person who focuses really on consumers. 
And you as a locality have to look at some of these trade-offs. And that's why some of this power must sit with um, local political entities, because there are trade-offs. We need to get millions of assets into people's homes. We need to make homes energy efficient. We need to ensure that every, every home becomes a little mini power station. We've got to roll out EV cars. And one of the biggest challenges here is how are we going to do that? How are we going to allow um, consumers to access these capital assets? And in recosting energy, we cover this a lot. But my sort of the panel on the on the right hand side says that there are trade offs. There are new mechanisms that need to be put in place and that does need um, sort of a political will that understands those trade offs and makes them in an equitable way. So I have a vision for a super local optimizer and let's say this is East Anglia, that you own your energy budget that you anchor your energy requirements around local assets, but with access to national assets, but you try and optimize those assets that you've got locally as much as possible, but that you really look at optimizing consumers and that you as an area get rewards for, uh, for energy reduction, not energy consumption. And that then changes in many ways the overall framing that we end up with a national framework, but with localized solutions that are incentivized to deliver a more zero compliant um, energy reduction system. And we did quite a lot of work on this in uh, one of our reshaping regulation projects. But I see there's an opportunity here. You've got some really excellent players in the sector um, in East Anglia who could be brought together as long as the incentives sit in the right place. And that goes back to what Guy was talking about in terms of um, market design, because actually the only incentive at the moment is to sell as much energy as possible. And so this would be my conclusion. We need a national framework which is light touch that reflects that um, everyone is different. The devolution tools that allow you and empower you to take things forward, not that dreadful spaghetti, alphabet spaghetti of um, resources, but actually localized funds that allow you to temper and to shape your the design of your um, outcomes, because currently if you try and access all these different pots that exist, you'll find yourself totally distorted by their requirements rather than by your local requirements. And very much please invest in skills and capabilities and harness people from beyond the energy sector. So it's down to you, East Anglia, to get on and get out there because I think there's a massive opportunity here and you're very well placed to, to deliver something very innovative and exciting. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Laura. Uh, OK, well, we've uh, a, a, a couple of questions come in. There's the, the apart from the one that's asking you to send a link about uh, the Northern Ireland approach, which I'm sure you can do separately. The two other uh, questions for you. How do we ensure a just transition is the first question. And the second question is uh, local system optimization is very important. Are the DSOs going fast enough? So those are the two questions. How do you ensure a just transition and are the DSOs doing enough? Okay, so just just transition is something I'm, I'm very passionate about and I co-chair um, a commission with Hilary Benn and Caroline Lucas on just transition. Um, there are winners and losers in this new system. And the issue is, is for us to identify the bridges that those losers need to not become losers. That there are people who live in energy inefficient homes. They're very obvious losers. There are people who work in the oil and gas sector. Um, they are obvious losers. However, there are pathways and we're developing those pathways by which they can bridge from where they are today into both new economy, 
into greater efficiency. And yes, we need to be constantly considering this. And as Guy, I know, has heard this before, but my proposition is that voters, consumers, citizens have a veto on net zero. So anybody who's interested um, and who thinks, uh, who are, as we all should be, passionate about um, accelerating towards a net zero economy must realise that it will be those people who lose out who do have the brakes on this system. So it is not a trivial issue for us all. It is certainly not a trivial issue for those people who are going to be left behind. And in recosting energy, we talk a lot about democratising in some ways some of these funding mechanisms so that you're actually allowing, and it, it comes out in Guy's and in Ed's work, um, you're ensuring that the consumer actually gets the full benefit of what they're doing for the system and they're not marginalised. On the DSO thing, I mean, this is really comes back to my devolution issue. Um, I keep on asking Ofgem, what is the hierarchy of action? ESO, DSO, DNO, me, my home, right? And I've been asking Jonathan, I think for about four years, you have got to, somebody has got to decide what the hierarchy is. And I would passionately pro propose that the hierarchy of action has to be um, as local as possible. And I make my analogy around the NHS. I go to the pharmacy to get my, you know, my paracetamol. I go to the GP when I need something more. I go to the consultant. And only when I am in real trouble do I go to the A&E department. Now, the ESO doesn't always like being called the A&E department. But fundamentally, we have got to work out resilience from a locality base up into the system. And this is where these devolution tools are really, really important and how one can actually shape a hierarchy and interaction of data so that um, understanding of where resilience lies and where weaknesses lies um, is moving through the system. Excellent, excellent. Some more questions uh, come in. Shouldn't we be incentivizing reduction in carbon emissions? as per the local carbon allowances defined by Tyndall Centre, rather than energy use per se. No local or regional plans around East Anglia seem to have recognised this necessity yet. So that, that's one. So there's one about uh, incentivising carbon emission reductions rather than just responding to price. OK, uh, the next question is if the energy systems, particularly electricity, are being designed for highly local situations. How does grid support and renewable firm power economically fit into this structure? So uh, so basically what this is saying is if you're turning the um, telescope around the other way and looking from the local area and designing from a local perspective, how does how do big assets like grid and large renewables fit into that? picture so uh carbon versus price yeah big versus small okay and um, to be frank we need it all so so let's not it, it's not an either or but it is about a complementary system design and so in some ways the the second and the first question you could conflate them by saying that a carbon is absolutely crucial and energy efficiency is also about cost and effectiveness and productivity. And I think I don't think it's an either or on carbon emissions and efficiency anyway. So I think that they work very importantly together. Um, the other issue is that we are we will if we are um, unproductive and inefficient and lazy about energy efficiency um, generally, uh, we will end up with a lot more costs in networks, we'll uh, end up being exceptionally wasteful. And, and net zero is a really interesting economic framing because it is not a consumption model, right? It is an optimization model, which is quite different. And so in many ways, what we've got to do, we can deliver energy efficiency and carbon reduction absolutely together. But just building more stuff and not optimising it first 
is wasteful in carbon. I mean, let's not be, let's please be frank, you know, electric cars have a lot of embedded carbon. Offshore wind farms have a lot of embedded carbon, um, as does upgrading networks. So, you know, let's look at it in the whole. OK, and, uh, and I think we've got time for one last uh, question, and it's about the st skills and jobs agenda that you mentioned. Very important, especially given the transition from legacy assets. Do we need a regional plan and who should be responsible for it? Well, I would suggest you probably do need a regional plan and that would be a, an excellent uh, initiative going forward. Um, and actually what you have is some really interesting characteristics because you've got some great offshore wind stuff going on um, uh, in East Anglia, but you've also got this key component, which is the thorny issue of agriculture. And sustainability, agriculture and energy is a really interesting nexus. And I would say very clearly that um, further education has not really embraced the whole energy world very effectively and really needs to, to step up. Um, universities need to ensure that they're doing what I call blended courses, not just about renewables or just about the silos. And what we really need in education is what Guy and everybody at the Catapult does is systems education and that is at a skills level and at um, an FE and at a university thing. This whole net zero proposition, this, this drive is all about the interrelationships, integration and also in many ways anticipating um, some, some of the unforeseen um, in challenges of, of integration and interrelationship. So we need to become much more sophisticated in our education, full stop, not just in relation to net zero, but systems thinking is absolutely crucial. OK, that's absolutely brilliant, Laura. Thanks. Uh, thanks ever so much for that. Um, it's now Ed's uh, turn. Uh, so, Ed, if I can hand over to uh, to you. Thanks, Simon, and thanks to Nigel and the team for having me today. So I thought I'd talk today about the role of electricity market design and how that influences and can encourage the place based or local changes that the other speakers have talked about that we're going to need for net zero. And this comes from a recent report that Policy Exchange published in December last year called Powering Net Zero, where we called for this concept of local electricity pricing. Next slide, please. So the motivation for this work is something that happened during the first coronavirus lockdown in summer 2020, which feels a, a spring and summer 2020, which feels an awful long time ago. So what happened during that lockdown is obviously a lot of us, more of us are at home and a lot of the offices and, and factories and things, um, or at least electricity demand was, was suppressed and it fell around 15% during that first lockdown period. And that meant that the market share of wind power and solar power was much higher than normal because the wind turbines and the solar panels were still, the wind turbines were still going round and the solar panels were still uh, generating electricity, but demand was lower. So the market share was much higher. And in a way, you can think about that as being a preview of our future electricity system, where we have more wind, more solar, uh, and much higher share of our demand being met with those clean sources. But that caused some problems. So because you had high renewables and low demand, it became more difficult for the electricity system operator, National Grid, to manage the grid. Uh, so they had to take more actions, particularly turning down wind farms in places like Scotland and potentially in East Anglia as well, to make sure the local network was not overloaded and also to keep the system secure, because at the moment we cannot operate without uh, large spinning power stations, traditional power stations. And that raised the so-called system balancing costs by two thirds. So the costs that National Grid incurred to turn off certain types of generators and to turn on others to keep the grid balanced. So if you were to roll that forward, uh, that there's potential there that, that actually as we build more wind and solar, although those projects themselves are relatively cheap, the overall system costs would start to rise. 
Next slide, please. And I argue that this is in large part due to the current way that electricity is priced in Great Britain. So we have a single price for wholesale electricity in Great Britain in each 30 minute trading period. So wherever you are in England, Wales or Scotland, the wholesale price for electricity, the price that generators receive is the same. And this means that for retail customers, uh, again, you're seeing very similar prices in all parts of the country if you have a, a time of use tariff. So overnight, prices are typically low because demand is low. In the middle of the day, prices are moderate because demand is moderate. And then as the sun goes down, prices tend to go up because demand is at its highest. And that means that, that supply is, is at the, the most um, under pressure, so prices go up. But things are relatively modest. So if you think about if I was a, an EV owner and I could have a, a special time of use electricity tariff, I'd probably charge my car overnight. Uh, it would be cheaper for me, but not that much cheaper. So everyone across Great Britain would see the same signal. They'd probably plug in overnight, uh, but it's not, not a huge incentive to, to help balance the grid. And I think this lies at the heart of um, you know, the challenge of, of a net zero electricity system. How do we get people, businesses, generators to respond to uh, electricity prices and local supply and demand for electricity? Next slide, please. So I'd argue that this current system that we have of electricity pricing, where it's a national price across Great Britain, worked well in the old electricity system. So we had power stations spread fairly evenly across Great Britain, coal, gas, nuclear, and the electricity network could relatively easily transmit electricity across the country at all times. So we didn't really need to think about these place-based solutions or local solutions. The national pricing ignores the physics of the electricity network, but that didn't, that didn't really matter. And um, I mean, there were some downsides, but it, but it was sort of manageable. Next slide, please. If you think about the new electricity system, which which has rapidly developed since since 2010, uh, and already we have have a lot of the features of this, we have wind farms concentrated really in certain regions of the country. So if you think about the net zero east region, huge amounts of offshore wind coming into that region, certainly much more than the demand. So that power needs to be tran transported away and it really therefore matters about how that electricity is actually going to get away and get through East Anglia and into the rest of Great Britain. Similarly for solar, solar is naturally concentrated in the south of England and the south of Wales, where um, you know we're close to the equator and so the, the output of your solar panels is higher. But you're really seeing these regional concentrations of different types of renewable energy technologies, all backed up by the power stations, the conventional power stations I mentioned before, when it's not sunny and not windy. But in this new system, our electricity network cannot transmit electricity to all parts of the country simultaneously. We're, we're increasingly having times where wind is trapped in Scotland and wind time turbines need to be turned down. We'll have similar things in East Anglia. Similarly, in Cornwall, there are times where there's too much solar and, and some of the solar is being turned down. And so this is where this national, national pricing for electricity really breaks down. The physics of the electricity sector really matters. And we're leaving money on the table by not reflecting that in our markets. Next slide, please. So we argue for this new system called local pricing or nodal pricing for electricity, where the price in each region would su reflect supply and demand for electricity. So if we just think about the East Anglia region on this map, you might see very low prices overnight, particularly if it's windy, because the wind would be meeting um, you know, local demand. So that would be send a strong signal to local customers and local industrial users to use electricity then. When we get to the middle of the day, actually East Anglia is an area where there is a good solar resource. So again, there could be very low prices in the middle of the day. And then only when you get to the evening, when demand ramps up and the solar ramps off, that's when you start to encourage people to use less electricity. And what this local pricing paradigm does is it encourages individuals to change the way that they use their electricity. So back to the electric vehicle example. In this new system, if I have an electric vehicle and I'm in Scotland, I charge it overnight. If I have an electric vehicle in East Anglia, I charge it maybe overnight if it's windy or in the middle of the day if it's sunny. And that difference in how people use their um, electric vehicles and electric heating systems 
will help to integrate wind and solar across across Great Britain. Next slide, please. And just finally, taking an example from the east of England and the net zero east region, what we've seen at the moment is that individual energy projects are just encouraged to find the easiest way of connecting to the electricity network. So this, these are two examples of offshore wind farms that are sort of crossing each other as they try and reach the national grid. I know these projects have been controversial locally, and there is a question about whether they could be better coordinated. And some of that is down to local area energy planning, some of it's down to national planning of offshore wind, but some of it's also to do with prices. Because at the moment, the wind farms don't really care where they connect, they just connect to the grid, they push their power onto the grid, and then it's someone else's problem to make sure it gets to the customers. Next slide, please. So how would this current system look once we have all these additional offshore wind farms? I would argue we would probably have some sort of suboptimal uh, connection with wires crisscrossing all over the east of England and probably not integrated uh, with other local uses of, of gas and hydrogen potentially and not really connecting the wind farms in where there are people who want to use that electricity. So uh, next slide please. So what you could see is a coordinated approach where you coordinate the electricity connections with maybe something like the Bacton gas terminal that someone already mentioned, which could again be coordinated with hydrogen production in certain strategic locations in the east of England. Potentially hydrogen could be co-located with nuclear. And there, there are questions here. Some of this is about planning and Guy has, has rightly mentioned and Laura has rightly mentioned the role of planning, but some of this is also about markets. If I'm an, I'm an offshore wind farm developer in this world of local pricing, I try and connect my wind farm into a place where there are people who want that electricity. So I connect my wind farm into a place where someone can use it to make hydrogen, or someone can use it to make steel, or someone can use it in a data center, or there's a strong network that can carry it to customers maybe in London. At the moment, the wind farm operators don't have that incentive, and I think that's, that's part of the reason we're not seeing uh, the right level of coordination. So that's my pitch for local electricity pricing and why I think it holds the key to a net zero energy system. Uh, but I'm keen to hear your questions. Thank you. Ed, thank you very much. There's a few questions uh, come in that are uh, maybe slightly um, uh, uh, not very closely related to the presentation, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll come on to those. Uh, I, just first, though, I was interested um, having been through various rounds of, of market reform, they require quite a significant political energy to make such big changes to the, um, uh, the, the sort of the trading arrangements. And I wondered what your read was of where we were on that political landscape. Is it, is it, is it viable that we are on the cusp of another phase of major market reform. Do you think that that is sufficiently important politically to get the, the tailwinds that it would need to come up with some of the changes you're describing? I can see Guy itching to come in here, uh, but my sense is that there is a general recognition in industry that there needs to be changes to the market. Um, part of it based on what happened last summer with the, the low demand being the preview of the future. I think there is a recognition amongst uh, organisations like the electricity system operator and Ofgem and Bayes that there needs to be changes. I don't know whether we yet have the the political sort of let's let's pull the trigger on this, but I would say that Bayes has published a couple of calls for evidence, including one on enabling a highly renewable net zero electricity system, and that call for evidence did start to ask a lot of questions about market design. And so I think that's certainly something that could evolve into a, a fully blown process of, of market reform. OK, thanks. And, and what we'll do is just before we um, finish the panel session, I will just go around each speaker for a last uh, for a last comment. So if, if Guy is itching, he, ha he will have his opportunity to scratch the itch. Um, so I've just put uh, put together a few of the other questions that have come up, Ed. Um, what do you propose happen to fossil fuel based legacy infrastructure in local areas? So what happens to the, the legacy fossil infrastructure? Uh, that's a comment for, for Laura. 
Then an interesting, quite political one. Will the east of England really be considered as a leading pilot region when the political drive is to level up the north of England and other regions? The east is virtually all blue, so why would government even consider the east at present? Um, and then a question, uh, who should be responsible for integrated, now this says palling, I'm assuming that means planning, um, uh, but I, uh, I'll i leave that for you, Ed, to answer. So uh, legacy assets, uh, the role of the East in levelling up and who should be responsible for planning. OK, I think I'll duck the uh, political question about levelling up because I'm not that's not really my specialist area. Mm -hmm. I think on the integrated planning, it's clear there has to be an element of national planning and an element of, of regional planning. So you've seen with Bayes is doing the offshore transmission network review, which is a national effort to coordinate the transmission of electricity from offshore wind farms and to connect it to the to the electricity grid. And this is something we talked about a lot in our recent paper on the future of the North Sea. But then as Guy and Laura have both been saying, there are clearly regional elements as you get to the uh, lower voltage distribution networks, but also a lot of the sources of demand are very are very local as well. Uh, so I think it 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 does need that multi level planning approach, um, which I guess is a bit of a cop out, but I think that is that is the the right compromise there. In terms of legacy infrastructure, so we do hear quite a lot about reuse of oil and gas offshore infrastructure for carbon capture and storage. I think we'll have to wait and see. Uh, in terms of the carbon capture and storage process that the government's running at the moment. I think that would be a first opportunity to see whether any of the successful pr proposals that come forward for funding, if those are reusing oil and gas infrastructure, that would be interesting because that would then be evidence that there is that potential. Um, but otherwise, I mean, some of, some of this stuff can be repurposed. So some power stations can be repurposed to uh, potentially house a big battery instead. So one of the big assets of a, a big power station is that it has a big grid connection. And so you can look at people connecting offshore wind farms into those power stations, where those power stations were, or battery storage or things like that, or hydrogen production and potentially hydrogen gas turbines. So, so there are lots of options. There will be some legacy infrastructure that just gets decommissioned, um, but I guess that will be handled through the, the standard regulated off-gen processes. OK, thanks, Ed. Um, OK, so a couple of last questions from the floor and, and, and I'll ask Ed to answer these, but then I'll um, uh, also move through uh, Guy and, and, and Laura, who may want to respond to these questions specifically or make some more other general comments. So the questions are, isn't the problem underpinning electricity pricing the lack of high resolution data? on demand and generation, which could give rise to flexible local electricity markets. The smart meter rollout has been a shambles and local electricity markets face regulatory headwinds. How to break through these barriers urgently? OK, so that's uh, the first one. And uh, the next one, in this new system where East Anglia has some very strong energy assets, does energy availability and cost become a key driver for the future East of England economic growth for industries relocating to this lower cost energy availability against, say, the Midlands engine? OK, so the two questions are really the role of data in triggering uh, flexible local electricity markets and the extent to which low cost uh, and available energy provides a uh, sort of regional competitive uh, economic advantage. So we go to Ed and then move through uh, uh, to uh, Guy and Laura. Great, thanks. Uh, these questions are absolutely music to my ears and I could have written them myself. Uh, so on the data question, clearly there are some local data issues in terms of getting right down to the household level. Although I would say the smart meter program is now picking up some steam and we are seeing some energy companies offering some innovative time of use tariffs uh, on the back of those smart meters. But clearly there's more to do, but I don't think that's a barrier to this model of local electricity pricing. 
because you could just implement local electricity pricing for generators and we have the data to do that certainly for generators above a threshold and this is how a lot of the markets work internationally they start with the generators um, with local pricing for generators and maybe regional or national pricing for customers and then over time they move to more granular pricing for customers as that data becomes available that was on the first question and then secondly around competitive advantage for different regions from having lower energy costs in this new system of local pricing. I think absolutely, and I think there will be some concerns about winners and losers within the UK from this sort of system, but I think we also have to think about internationally. So if you're going to say everyone in the UK has to have sort of medium energy costs, <clears throat> because then we don't have any winners and losers in Great Britain or in the UK, then you're not then you're going to lose out to places that have really cheap electricity particularly for things like steel production data centers aluminium etc so if we say the east of england should have cheap electricity but we won't let that happen because actually that'll be unfair to other parts of the country then these heavy energy users will go to sweden or they'll go to one zone in sweden where they have regional pricing um you know there might be a zone where there's very cheap pricing so i think we need to think about the international um, how, how regions of Great Britain can compete internationally with, with heavy energy users. Great, thanks uh, Ed. Uh, Laura, would you like to make some either respond to those questions or make some final few comments? Um, I, I was interested in the question about levelling up and that um, the North is going to get all the focus and all the rest of it. Um, Sometimes both local authorities and actually the energy sector do hang around waiting to be asked or to be told, right? Um, you've got an opportunity just to own something. Just don't wait for competitors to move in or to feel that you're on the back foot. Start pushing and put yourself on the front foot and to be frank, listen, net zero is the most extraordinary uh, journey that we're going on. Nobody knows how it's going to really pan out. We know the destination, but the journey is going to be quite messy, right? Um, the point is, you've got some uniquenesses in East Anglia. Own them, devise the strategy, um, develop a plan, bring together the right people, and as they say, <clears throat> in the world of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. And I would just move on it and don't worry about the competition. We all need to get on with this. And you come, but you go to uh, government with a clear plan, with a strategy and a time frame, right? And that you've actually understood the trade-offs, the consumer trade-offs, the economic and the industrial trade-offs, um, you're in a very, very good position. Um, I really would stress again this issue, your uniqueness about being on the coast with offshore wind, but also micro tidal and the agricultural component, uh, whether that be biomass, whether it be you've got massive amount of food manufacturers, and food is going to come under quite a lot of scrutiny from consumers about um, carbon consumption. So you might find that if you can create and design the most effective decarbonized industrial optionality, that you actually attract even more food manufacturing to your area. So start thinking about what you've got that is your USPs and Tees Valley will have its own USPs, they're not yours. So don't try and compete with them, create distinctive propositions. Great, thanks, uh, Laura. Guy, final comment from you? Yeah, just, just very briefly. So, so I mean, just, just to reiterate that point, I mean, the, the fact that it's quite a blue area is, is, it could be seen as a disadvantage, but actually a big advantage, you know, if the MPs, get themselves organized around a coherent plan as Laura said you know if George Freeman and James Wilde and all these all these guys in the area are, are, are kind of pushing it then then you've got then you've got a really good chance so I, I you know I, I think that's 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 potentially an advantage with central government just on the question that I was itching to get into on, on is the political appetite for the kind of reform both in terms of the market reform which you know Laura 
um, Ed and I are arguing for, you know, big changes to 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 how electricity markets and and the kind of local planning, which which I think are the, the, you know both both very linked. I mean, I mean, I've been in the room when the light when it looks a bit wobbly with the lights going out and ministers, and it's not a nice room to be. <laughs> It's, it's a lot of lot of kind of you know people looking at their careers and saying, well, that was good while it lasted, kind of kind of time. Um, so you absolutely have to ensure security of supply going forward. But I think all the points, if I was a, the good ministers and the good officials, are always saying what is the danger that's coming around the corner. And I think Ed said it out really nicely. Last summer was a very good, um, and that should have been a warning shot. And if I was in my old job kind of advising ministers, I would have had working groups thinking about, OK, that that scenario is very close to what is going to happen very, very soon. And it didn't look very nice and it looks very expensive. And, you know, what the hell are we doing? So so you be, you'd be getting to do that. Now, I'm not sure whether that's happening. I don't see much evidence of, of, of that being gripped, but it's always quite hard to tell from the outside what's 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 going on. So. My my central case and, and on the kind of local national um, strategic question, which I think is another big strategic question. I'm not sure government's there, but again, if you've got local authorities, you've got local MPs, you've got local groups saying, look, this is not, you know, if I'm frank, this is not community energy. This is about a proper transition to do it, of which community energy is part of it. This is about, you know, we need a plan to to because we think this is important for our local area and we think there's going to be transition jobs and, and all of those those things. And we need to, you know, go there and shape government and say that this is what what are you doing to enable us to do this? Because it's not about always about handouts. It's about enabling with the money available, with the resources available and with a bit of governance structure in there to, to really transform it. Um, so I don't know. It's, you know, there's, we're, we're pushing it very hard. Others are pushing it very hard. Um, it, it, it needs to happen. My my central case, my central case is, as always, there'll be some crisis and then it'll there'll be an opportunity to, to transform it. So either the, the grid will get really wobbly or, um, you know, happen at a local level and, um, you know, there'll, there'll be, you know, kind of protests because people can't charge up their electric vehicles or something like that. And then we'll suddenly, oh, good. Anyone got a plan for how we transition? Oh, good. We'll pull something off the shelf. It's my kind of theory of government by progress by crisis. Brilliant. Great. Well, thanks ever so much to the speakers. There have been one or two other questions come in. Maybe I see Ed's already started to answer those um, directly, so maybe the, the panel would like to take a look at the Q&A and, and, and post their answer to that. But I'll hand back uh, to Nigel. Great. Thank you, Simon. Can you hear me? Yeah, uh, great. Um, super panel discussion. Um, very well structured, Simon, and I really enjoyed contributions uh, from, from, from all our uh, speakers. I, I, I just very quickly before I dive into some of the more detailed uh, stuff that I'd like to talk about, uh, just pick up on three things that, that came out. First of all, um, I strongly agree with Laura's comment that you've got to work with what you've got. Um, and it's very clear here in East Anglia that we have some very uh, regionally specific uh, and differentiated uh, conditions. Um, we cannot influence uh, what's happening in Teesside, but we can make our case. And I think one of the um, uh, lines of engagement that we've uh, already uh, begun is, is talking with um, some of the regional MPs about um, the specific needs of the region. Uh, and how we need to get away from any um, binary conversation uh, around metropolitan versus rural, legacy assets versus no assets. Um, we have a mix of circumstances here, uh, and uh, because of that, we will hopefully be able to come up with some very specific solutions that, that meet those needs. So uh, I fully agree with that. Um, and, and it is no surprise, uh, Ed will hear that I'm fully on board with locational uh, pricing. We've got an electricity system uh, which has in many 
fundamental respects failed to change uh, for 20 years. Um, and we are very much an outlier uh, in the way we structure our energy market. Um, and if Ofgem uh, is to want to um, better understand the contribution uh, of local energy, smart local energy solutions um, to, to delivering net zero uh, at least cost, it has to rebalance the mechanisms so that local flexibility uh, is um, uh, an important uh, driver or catalyst for securing value. Um, and um, I guess that was the point uh, Guy was making uh, at the end. We, we, we know that the current system uh, is struggling under certain conditions. Um, there's a tendency to explain that away uh, by reference to specific circumstances, but the overall costs of managing the system have grown exponentially over uh, recent low demand conditions. We have the anomalous situation uh, of size well being constrained back uh, for a large part of last summer. Uh, uh, one reads in the papers about a similar probability this year. Um, we, we need to start thinking about uh, not just the, the local contribution, but how the central structures need to adapt to work in parallel with that. So um, uh, I think that has set the scene very, very well uh, for uh, our next session, which is going to be more about how we are developing our regional agenda uh, for the east of England. Um, so thank you very much to all our panellists and to Simon. Um, I'm going to very quickly scoot through um, probably the, the, the next slide, Michael, and then the fourth one around delivering net zero. Those are the two I'd like to focus on here, if you can get that up. Um, I think the point has already been made uh, very well um, that um, there are, no, going back, Michael, please. Um, that, that, you know, we have an abundance of existing energy assets. So um, a, a very important element um, of uh, the debate uh, that, that we are engaging in needs to anchor itself uh, within what is quite a busy uh, 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 energy uh, context. Um, and um, there are a lot of issues around uh, migrating from, from legacy assets and allowing new assets to work more optimally uh, we've got a target of 40 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2030. A lot of planning issues, uh, as Ed uh, identified around uh, uh, realising that. Um, um, but we are not short of, uh, uh, of an assets and we, we are one of the very few net exporting regions uh, in Great Britain. So that, that should put us uh, uh, starting from a position of, 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 of strength. What it does mean, of course, is that we can't just focus on supply side solutions. We have to think about capturing value of that within the local economy. We have to think a lot harder around all the things Guy mentioned at the beginning, uh, which is decarbonising heat, decarbonising transport. Um, as Laura's been saying, engaging the demand side uh, and getting consumer uh, uh, buy-in. But there is clearly an immense opportunity. And what we need to do uh, in Net Zero East is uh, try and create a debate that recognises those differences. I think industrial areas in the North have done that very well. Uh, we now need to identify the specific needs of how East Anglia can make a material and real contribution to delivering net zero. So the solutions are not just around further decarbonisation of power, as Guy said, it is around um, uh, providing solutions that recognise a predominantly agricultural 
uh, economy that recognises that transport emissions have actually been rising in the region um, over uh, uh, the recent past. Identifying opportunities uh, maybe in new agri-tech and aquaculture uh, sectors. So there is a huge palette to work with, uh, which I think is one of the, the fascinating things about the work we're hoping to scope out uh, on uh, Net Zero East. If we move forward two, three slides, Michael, to delivering Net Zero. So um, I think in different ways, um, our speakers have already set out some of the central drivers and touch points and, and elements of their thinking that uh, do allow us to begin to set out a route map um, uh, uh, for the regional work that we're doing uh, in East Anglia. And I guess Laura has very, very clearly made the point that net zero isn't something or, or shouldn't be something that is done to communities um, and, and, and businesses and households. It's something that needs to be uh, driven from the bottom up. One of the many reports that appeared uh, alongside the um, uh, policy package uh, before Christmas was not just the, excuse me, <coughs> the Climate Change Committee's overall recommendations for the six carbon budget, but within that there's a very good um, document uh, which actually um, we have uh, picked up and uh, read very closely and it's, it's around how you engage communities and local authorities uh, in, in, in the process um, and that's one of the areas that we're going to focus on now. So what I'm going to ask um, Charlotte, Michael and Jonathan to do is just to give you a sense of the more specific work streams that we are envisaging. Uh, our website goes live today, uh, so that's a good start. There's lots of interesting stuff and we will put round a link to all those who attend uh, today's session uh, so that you can find the presentations and the materials that we're publishing today. Um, but we're going to now uh, hand over to Charlotte, who's going to tell you a little bit more about how we're actually planning to engage with local authorities, support them in their climate action plans. Uh, and then Michael is going to um, uh, ex expand a little bit on the quite deep work that we've been doing around spatial mapping, uh, because this is all place based. We need to look at how things relate to each other, how production assets fit with the networks. There's the water dimension. We've done a lot of work in this area and Michael's going to give you an overview of that. Uh, and then Jonathan is going to take you through some of our uh, early stage thinking on some of the uh, place-based focuses uh, that we're developing and which we're hoping to develop into uh, more specific proposals uh, for, for research-based work that will help us support local stakeholders uh, in unpacking the uh, net zero um, um, uh, challenge. So over to you, Charlotte. Apologies for that. I was the first person to mess up the microphone. <laughs> I hope everyone can hear me now okay. So as Nigel mentioned, um, we're at Net Zero East in focused on building up a, a suite of creative solutions that recognise the local challenges and opportunities that we have here in East Anglia for delivering Net Zero. Um, before I go on to the two topics that I'd like to pick up specifically today, I should flag that we are intending to do a kind of suite of uh, webinar engagement activities that are going to drill down into specific um, avenues so that if there's certain topics that you're expressly interested in and others that aren't quite as relevant for you, you'll be able to, to pick and choose um, and come to any and all that you find interesting. 
So first of all, next slide please, Michael. Um, what I thought we'd talk about is the role that local authorities can play. So lots of them have been um, active in declaring climate emergencies, um, putting out dates from when they would like to achieve carbon neutrality. So there's ranges in the East Valley between 2030 and 2050. Um, and there's some provisional documents coming out. We know that lots of people are working busy behind the scenes to, to get some ideas in place. But really the things that have been published publicly to date are a little bit loose. You know, they've got some aims, they've got some um, avenues to pursue, but less so on the concrete actions and a timeline in which those are going to be implemented. Um, obviously, the kind of transitional phases that we've seen in the energy sector and, and other sectors have been driven uh, from the top down, but we see increasingly um, devolved institutions and, and local government is going to be having a critical role to play in starting to drive that change from the bottom up as well. Um, so I think the, the key sentence from, from my piece is that we would like to see local authorities have the support and funding available to them so that they can both achieve their existing um, ambitions around net zero but also extend them, a kind of extend the, the range of influence to the local constituents and businesses as well. So we know that they've already got uh, a selection of key powers and duties around so planning, uh, building regs perhaps, or other environmental protection responsibilities. But the problem is that not all of these levers are joined up. So you can get so far and then you might come across a brick wall that's responsibility of another authority or um, something you don't have direct control over. So we'd certainly like to have conversations as looking at how we can build a holistic approach that takes the levers that are already available to local authorities um, and adds another layer on to see how far we can get with uh, net zero progress. So next slide please Michael. So one way that you can achieve and extend net zero ambitions would be to have a kind of comprehensive climate action plan. Um, you know it could it could take the form of a local area energy plan, such as Kai was talking about earlier, that encompasses maybe two or three local authorities coordinating action. Maybe they've got one transport specialist in one local authority and they've got a housing specialist in another. You know, you combining the skills um, and combining the um, range of influence. But it could also be a very targeted thing. So a specific town might have a little transport action plan. It, there's going to be variations in the scale and scope of these items um, and we're happy to have conversations around any such plans. Um, within that we've, we've got a number of tools already available in the market that we can use to build uh, climate action plans whether that's from making a standardised greenhouse gas emission reporting so obviously tracking emissions as we go is, is essential but they've also got um, a range of things that will help support retrofit building improvement programmes or fleet rollout programmes. So there's plenty to look into um, and obviously something that we're going to be deep, diving into deeper as we go. Um, next slide please. So our first publication as Net Zero East will be launching next week. Uh, what we've done is synthesised all of the publicly available information on local climate action plans that we've seen to date. Um, we've got a selection from Norfolk, Suffolk, Cambridge and Essex um, and sort of introduces the results with some of the things that we think about, um, you know, the resources available and the necessity of uh, lo local authorities uh, involvement in the net zero transition. Um, but if you've got any specific questions for your local authority, if there's anyone on the line, uh, we'd certainly love to have a conversation. Um, next slide, please, Michael. So another area that we're going to be pursuing, um, certainly scoping initially, is the idea of regional carbon offsets. And I know carbon offsets can be a bit of a controversial topic. You know, is it the easy way out or um, should it be saved only for those emissions that can't be avoided by any other means? Um, but I think it's an important one to consider and it's an important one um, to acknowledge that, you know, it could have a big impact in terms of the land use change element. So um, if it's managed correctly and appropriately, you can um, 
potentially see certain local authorities in East Anglia being carbon negative. There is potential there to achieve that. So I think uh, one of our first steps will be to work with some kind of verification models through academic institutions, um, sort of test our current working understanding, um, but then also uh, work with community groups to establish a, a baseline as well. So go to the next slide, please. This is just a bit of a, a handy infographic to say how this might work. You know, you're not, you don't have to have a, a specific um, project in mind. It could be a pooled thing. So you could have an organisation that wants to offset part of its emissions that it can't avoid. It uh, provides investment into a pot, which could then be specified. Do they want to, to support reforestation? Do they want to support biodiversity in a certain location? Um, do they want to invest in community energy? There's, there's lots of ways they could have uh, optionality. Um, and then the money then is recycled through to the relevant organisations that can achieve those carbon offsettings. But again, early stages of thinking and happy to take your thoughts on that as well. So without further ado, I will hand over to Michael for our super duper mapping platform. Great, thank you, Charlotte. Presumably I can be heard. Oh, good, great. So yes, I'll, I'll talk through today then some of our local granular mapping work that we've been doing to date. So I'll look at why we see the mapping as an essential part of what we're doing, how it's helping to inform our understanding and our knowledge base. But also we'll take an early look at some of the data that we've collected and that we've mapped and visualised. And I'll speak a little bit about a, an online portal that we're hoping to get up and running in the, in the coming months. So next slide. So yeah, so why is spatial mapping important? So first and foremost, there's that ability to visualise the data. You know, it's, it says a lot more than what you can get from a spreadsheet. You know, both are useful. They have their, their values and different purposes, but a, a unique aspect we're hoping to, to pull through with the mapping portal is an ability to both visualise, self-serve and download data as necessary. And we'll construct some kind of data library so that this kind of stuff can be located and, and accessed as needed. There's also this, this idea of understanding local attributes. So, you know, we've touched on it quite a lot today, that the fact that each area is different and that we need to take place-based approaches, uh, people-centric solutions. Um, what works for one community might not work for another. Uh, for example, through constraints in systems or networks or even community buy and that kind of thing. And then following on from what Guy was talking about, so local area energy planning. So th this will ultimately allow us to explore future local energy scenarios. So through the, the data that we've got mapped and, and stored and accessible, we can start to granularly map things like infrastructures and associated capacities. Um, and that will enable things like choices around system options. So, for example, with choices of heat, um, capacities of networks and associated constraints can uh, basically influence our decisions in, in particular areas and, and also understanding options for off gas grid areas. So we've got quite a lot of off gas grid areas in, in Norfolk and Suffolk and, and beyond. So, yeah, we need to think about how, what the, the data that we've collected can do to inform some of that and, and make strategic decisions that are um, well thought out and also long term and robust. So yeah, we'll, we'll build on a lot of the work that Laura has been doing, thinking about some of the energy data task force kind of things, uh, best practice principles, also what Icebreaker One has been looking at in, in, in respect of opening up data. And if we can start to adopt some of this, we'll be able to further enhance the value of spatial mapping and also associated outcomes for communities and, and, and local stakeholders. So just taking a look at some of the stuff that we have mapped. So I'll walk through some of some of the mapping at a high level, um, primarily just as a means to show you some of the depth and breadth of the information that we have across the east of England. So taking a, a look first at, at carbon emissions. So, you know, you can get this overall picture of local authorities initially, which will help to inform some of the baseline assessment work that we'll be doing. But what's what's really more valuable is when we start to drive into those local areas. So you can see there now on the, on the map on the right, uh, some of those large emitters across the east of England. So 
looking there at the, the east coast, you've got the Great Yarmouth CCGT plant, and actually that accounts for around a third of the, the entire local authority's emissions. So, you know, clearly a, a key starting point would be to reduce emissions there. Looking across the region, you've got some food processing dotted in the middle, working up to Kings Lynn CCGT plants up there as well. So that's all well and good. We can identify some of those large emitters where they sit and we can we can tackle them. But what's potentially more valuable for local communities is this idea of building up a, a carbon model or emissions based model. So I think we plan on showing things like NOx, particulate matters, so PM 2.5 and carbon as well. So that map there is showing CO2 across the region and straight away there you can see you know, transport is a big contributor to, to the region's emissions. But you can also start to, to pull out um, clusters of carbon emissions. So some of the work we've, we've done in North Norfolk or, or started to, to scope in North Norfolk is looking at uh, some, some of the top emitters across the region that aren't necessarily those large scale emitters that you'll see on a regional or, or national level. Um, but places like um, beachfronts and, and tourism locations can actually be quite high in emissions and not necessarily something you, you'd think to target straight away. So you can start to to look at things on a more granular level, which is, is more useful for, for wider change. So here as well, Matt, just to show you some of the, the generation we've got um, across the east of England. Um, you can see there quite a, a large concentration of solar, also onshore wind on the, on the uh, western side of, of, of the region. Um, but we've also got a lot of smaller distributed generation, um, which is also popping up there as well. So, you know, a region with a lot of distributed generation that needs to be thought about in terms of how it interacts with the network, where it sits. Um, and, and not just that, thinking offshore as well, we have, you know, a vast array of offshore wind and lots more to come online as well. So we've got uh, offshore wind farms there that have been consented to and those that are in planning. Um, so, you know, it's, a, it's a, a region that would benefit, like Nigel said, from, from local pricing, but we also have to think about how all this interacts together. So if we look ahead at uh, where the infrastructure lies, so that there is National Grid's high voltage network. But if we if we look at some of UKPN stuff, we can we can see where the, the network lies more more across the region. Um, also thinking about how that connects in with offshore wind. So so to date, we really do think about the two separate the, the two, two systems as quite separate when really the we should think about them in a, in a more jo joined up way. And also those that might come up, come online in the future. So we know that there's there's those that have been planned at, at the moment. They might not sit where they where they're, they're thinking at the moment. But you know we need to think about where future connections might come online. The kind of communities that will will uh, see the the impacts of that. And also through some of the work we've been doing at Hydrogen East, we've got quite a good um, outlook on the the gas network now offshore but also onshore, so how that connects in and where that lies in respect of the electricity landscape. And also uh, looking at cadence network as well, at a more granular level, you can start to, to figure out where exactly uh, the system lies. Uh, and what's potentially more useful is when we look at a granular level and we start to look at street level data. So a lot of this isn't readily available and it isn't easily accessible. So if we can start to bring this together, and build up this really granular picture across the east of England. It will help in, in all kinds of ways in terms of planning and, and, and future future uh, scenarios. And here, really, just to show, you know, the region is quite constrained. So, you know, it suffers from uh, well, not suffers, but it, it's difficult for new generation coming online. It's not always a, an easy process, as as many of the local authorities tell us. So. You know, we need to, to take that into account when we're thinking about what might be best for the east of England um, and how that might be different to other regions. So, yeah, so really that's just the tip of the iceberg. I don't really have as too much time to go into more detail, but I would have loved to have shown you some of uh, the other data that we're collecting and developing. So, you know, in respect of natural capital, it's not just this energy infrastructure, energy generation kind of thing that we want to to uh, incorporate and focus on. It's also understanding the, the limits of uh, and also how natural the natural environment should be incorporated into the whole picture of net zero. Socioeconomics as well, thinking about potentially areas that 
uh, are maybe suffering from from higher levels of fuel poverty and how that might align with align with um, EPC ratings and whether action could then be taken in respect of home upgrades in, in that sense. Uh, generation assets, we, we're, we're mapping those out. Infrastructure, thinking about how data and water pipelines might might start to interact as well. So there's lots sitting there, lots we want to work on, develop further. And, and as Nigel will touch on in a bit, we're hoping to bring on some, some additional resources in the future to, to further uh, some of this work. So, and yeah, so that brings me to what we're planning to launch, ideally autumn 2021, maybe a little bit sooner, depending on how things progress. But this this concept of net zero map is what we're calling it at the moment, um, making a, a self serve portal that allows you to access all this data, um, also pull out reports, uh, start to visualize things in a different way, uh, start to build on some analysis. So you know it's all well and good seeing where where the where the infrastructure lies, where generation assets sit, but what does that tell us about the region? What what can we bring from that? Uh, and, and like I said, we're going to be expanding that across a range of areas. Uh, namely environmental, socioeconomics, natural capital. So um, yeah, watch this space. I'm sure we'll keep you updated with things, but uh, yeah, it's, it's quite a exciting development anyway. Thank you very much, Michael. Uh, yes, it is very exciting and um, it's been a pleasure watching this evolve very quickly uh, over a relatively uh, short period of time. Uh, we have been engaging fairly widely um, through a number of work streams, uh, taking views on our approach here. And I think it's fair to say the feedback um, has been very positive. Um, uh, and, and you know one of the, the very uh, one of the strengths of what we're trying to do um, is to cover all those other issues outside of the traditional energy system which are going to form part of the debate. So that goes well into the, the transport world. Uh, we're looking at road congestion rates, we're looking at land usage. Uh, Michael's already flagged natural capital. Um, uh, in the first instance we're going to get Norfolk and Suffolk right, uh, but uh, we are already um, in the process of taking on resource um, uh, to uh, allow Michael to broaden out. Um, we will initially uh, uh, extend the platform into Cambridgeshire and Essex and Bedford uh, and dependent on appetite, um, uh, it will clearly extend into the whole of the east of England uh, and, and, and who knows what might come after that. But the important thing is to get our immediate short term focus uh, on, on the New Anglia area uh, because that's where we're rooted, uh, but we will go through a process of engagement um, with neighbouring LEPs, with the Greater South East Energy Hub, uh, with other uh, uh, district councils and county councils uh, because um, we, we think we're already beginning to find some very interesting interactions through the mapping, uh, which um, some of the more conventional tools uh, miss. So thank you very much for that, Michael. Um, are we going on to Jonathan now? I believe so. <coughs> Good. So uh, just, just take a couple of minutes very briefly just to almost introduce so what are we going to do with the mapping that Michael's just been talking about? So I'm just going to introduce an example of some of the place based initiatives that we're starting to map. So next slide, please, Michael. So very much building on what, what Ed was saying um, earlier in his presentation around looking at a more coordinated approach uh, to large scale energy infrastructure, certainly offshore and onshore, and certainly picking up on what Michael's just presented in terms of the uh, understanding of some more the granular infrastructure options so we can you know, hopefully match top down, bottom up. We're actually developing some energy hubs as yeah, that to deliver some of that coordinated approach, both looking at supply and demand sectors. <clears throat> you would have heard uh, our team as, as Hydrogen East, so our sister to Net Zero East, uh, talk about the Bacton study or the Bacton terminal, and we're actually publishing uh, some of the work on, the, the, on, on our thinking around Bacton towards the end of this month, early May. <clears throat> we're also got a mix of, you can see uh, some uh, gas, 
wind, solar and nuclear. So we're looking across all the broad mixes. Hydrogen is part of that, battery storage is part of those concepts, but also as Nigel's touched on uh, and many of the speakers have touched on, all of the various opportunities around solar, um, around you know, demand for, for transport, for, for heating, for domestic, for householders, for commercial industry are all uh, covered in our thinking. So we're looking at how we apply that, that mapping, uh, you know, the mapping and a granular approach to really inform an evidence-based data-driven approach to designing in infrastructure. I'm going to very, very quickly touch on Power Park in a second, but we're, we're looking at these four initially. So Power Park is the most easterly point uh, of the UK in Lowestoft. We're also looking at Scotto. Um, and that's, if you see the solar farm there, that's not a road in between the solar farm, it's actually a, a former runway. Uh, so that's actually the former RAF cultural site in North Norfolk. Uh, again, huge opportunity with a 50 meg solar farm, uh, but also a uh, high pressure gas ring main across the site that could lend itself to dem dem demonstration, testing and uh, new technologies. But also we're, we're engaging and working very closely with Sidewell uh, and looking at the free port east opportunities around the port of Felixstowe for integration of nuclear, offshore wind, hydrogen, and looking at the, uh, the opportunities around transport, rail, and a whole various uh, other options of uh, marine shipping. Next slide, please, Michael. <clears throat> Just touching on a little bit more on the power park lower stuff opportunities. This is kind of the concept design. So how we can potentially integrate wind and solar to look at powering desalination uh, opportunities to produce fresh water. We can then put through electrolysis to produce hydrogen. We can use that for fuel cell and uh, fuel cell generation a little bit later on. And then looking at the mapping of the, the flows between power, flexible electricity and uh, low carbon green hydrogen um, in terms of gas network, transport uses and obviously ports. Uh, next slide please, Michael. Just conscious of time as well. And this is kind of just on the map here, you can see what we're looking at. This is the zoomed in version uh, or part of lower stuff. You can see the, uh, some of the, uh, the yellow uh, pipes there uh, as part of our mapping. Um, but we've got a, a real concentration of a gas injection point, a bus depot, a development site uh, really aimed at uh, supporting the, the lowest off port for offshore wind and other marine energy sectors. We have an onshore turbine, which is technically an offshore prototype, which is having a few problems and could do with uh, repowering or potentially upgrading. And we have a, a, a clean energy innovation centre, Orbis Energy, right next door as well as potential uh, offtake. So suddenly oh, we've got Birdseye, I should say as well, in terms of one of the big food producers, also one of Suffolk's larger point sources uh, in terms of emissions. So we have this interesting cluster uh, where we're looking at a uh, designing this integrated, flexible uh, you know, net zero energy hub. Um, next slide, please. I think I'm handing over to Nigel here. Are running a little bit out of time. Uh, Jonathan's highlighted four of the uh, obvious sites. Uh, I made the comment earlier that um, it's only when you start looking carefully at the mapping that you uh, identify uh, convergence of uh, factors uh, that mean that um, there might be the ability to uh, have more uh, regionally focused arrangements uh, and also mine local flexibility. Excuse me. <coughs> One of the areas that we have been also looking at is uh, the Egham, um, Egham, Egmere, uh, wrong county, um, uh, enterprise zone, uh, which is uh, uh, near Walsingham in, in the centre of, of Norfolk in North Norfolk uh, District Council's territory. Uh, and we were just um, uh, looking to see what we found really. And the interesting thing is we, there's the landing point for Sheringham Shoals um, um, uh, next to the site, uh, and, and that's in the process of being upgraded. There's an ex uh, existing uh, 20 megawatt solar farm um, that's been developed by uh, uh, the Renewables uh, Investment Group. Uh, there's also a five megawatt AD facility uh, that injects uh, biomethane um, into the uh, gas network. Uh, and the whole area is within um, a active network management zone um, where uh, potentially 
uh, UK power networks might be calling for flexibility tenders uh, at some point. So there's a lot of things happening in one particular area which you wouldn't normally uh, see um, on, on conventional maps. And what we've also been, look, uh, what we intend to do um, um, with this uh, site uh, potentially um, is to see whether or not uh, it could be the basis for some uh, more detailed design study, um, uh, possibly a feasibility study. Um, um, we can look at aspects around uh, not just smart local energy systems, but community tariffs. Uh, there's the neighbouring uh, Hookham uh, estate um, with uh, a lot of tenanted property. There's a need for EV charging uh, in the region. And bearing in mind that this is a, a export constrained zone, there are many opportunities. So um, this is just one idea uh, that we've got on our, our, our list. So if you move on, Michael, please. So um, I guess one of the ideas we were looking to take forward with um, some of the uh, councils and, and parish councils is really how we can use the tools we're developing, the knowledge of existing targets, the existing programmes being developed by local authorities, use of the mapping tool, our wider sectoral knowledge to work out what works best where and why? What can we learn from individual sites that we can maybe replicate or scale uh, in other areas? So uh, we're going to start a conversation, uh, hopefully with some of the regional local authorities, uh, on, on, on what we should be looking for. Where should we be focusing efforts? What is the right evaluation technique? what might the linkages be with local area energy planning um, and, and really how one can break out of the mindset uh, that, that, that the current system operates within around um, centrally dispatched electricity, but how can one uh, uh, assess and prioritise solutions that will better deliver net zero through allowing uh, heat and transport decarbonisation, uh, as well as engagement with local businesses, communities uh, and householders. So high level stuff, but we think we know what the direction of travel is. Um, and um, this is just a good example of, of the thinking that we need to take into the uh, initial stage of our work planning within uh, net zero east. So that's all I've got to say. Uh, um, I think, is that the end of the road? Okay, so it's back, it's back to me. Okay, sorry, misunderstanding. Um, so hopefully you fa uh, found um, today's remarks uh, helpful. Um, hopefully they chime with uh, um, some of the conversations that, that you are having as regional stakeholders and other uh, proponents um, of uh, net zero. Um, we're going to be uh, continuing the early stage work uh, that we have started. We're looking to develop um, a network with local uh, businesses uh, political leaders uh, as well as local uh, authorities. We're looking to stimulate debate and awareness. Uh, we're going to continue to develop the evidential basis for our work uh, by following what's going on, identifying good practices elsewhere and developing our mapping work. Um, and we will continue to try uh, and act uh, uh, as an advocate uh, and influence some of the debates that really need to be kick-started this year if we're going to develop effective 
net zero uh, strategies. Uh, the projects that we're pro uh, currently scoping um, are uh, high level of it at this stage. Um, that is because we have just launched. Um, um, but as Charlotte has already said, we're looking to um, hold more focused uh, engagement sessions um, and share our thinking as it develops probably every six to eight weeks. Um, and at our first gathering, um, which I think we're trying to organise for the middle of June, um, we will uh, take a closer look um, at our guide to local authorities. That will have been published. Um, <coughs> sorry, when I say local authorities, I mean um, the, the East Anglian local authorities. Uh, we will distill the findings. We will uh, provide a commentary on what we think is good. Um, uh, um, what, what are the mechanisms that probably suit best uh, in this region uh, and we will also give a further update uh, on our mapping and hopefully uh, begin to show how we're looking to extend the work outside of Norfolk uh, uh, and, uh, and Suffolk. Um, we will also be looking in the meantime to um, engage more widely with uh, regional local authorities. We're already having conversations with several but we want to talk to anybody who's keen to uh, um, share with us their thinking so that we can hopefully act as a, uh, as a catalyst. Um, um, and on the basis of that, we will develop uh, a more forward looking work plan. At some point, once we've established ourselves, uh, we will be launching the portal service. Um, um, uh, and we will also uh, be looking to develop advisory work um, with um, uh, key stakeholders in the area, not just local authorities, but businesses. Uh, and also we're very uh, keen to understand better um, how we can support the better uh, awareness around um, uh, action by uh, consumers so that they can um, uh, participate in, in the journey uh, to net zero. We'll be taking on uh, another couple of uh, graduates in the near future to support us uh, in our activities. That'll take the complement um, up to, um, already losing count, five, six. I think we've got a, a graduate doing some work for us at the moment. Uh, as part of a more specific project, but we're looking to grow, develop our services uh, and engage with you um, in this very exciting journey uh, and see if we can have an impact uh, here in East Anglia uh, and, and facilitate and expedite the process that we uh, need to follow. So uh, please follow us on Twitter as well. New uh, handle at net zero east. Um, I'm still very active on social media at New Anglia Energy um, uh, and, and, and we're also continuing to develop our work and plans under the Hydrogen East banner. But please uh, follow what we're doing. It's been an exciting 12 months to date and we think the next 12 months are going to be even more exciting. So thank you very much for your time uh, and your very um, um, focused questions. If there are points we've missed, we will come back to you. Otherwise, have a good afternoon. Thank you very much.